Unlike the previous modules, this module might need a little bit of a summary to help make sure that we're making the connections that we need to and to understand that all of the videos in this particular section have been puzzle pieces of one single big picture. If we look back at the chapters and the main goals of those chapters, in chapter 20, we talked about what stuff is out in space that is available to make stars from. Our one section of chapter 21 that we talked about is telling us how stars actually form from that material. Chapter 22 talked about what stars do once they are fully formed and how we can test that. So in chapter 22, we talked about star clusters, we talked about the main sequence, and we talked about fusion, making sure we understand that stars are powering themselves from hydrogen to helium fusion while they are on the main sequence, all that kind of stuff. Chapter 23 went into the details of how low mass stars die, their outer layers become a planetary nebula, the core that's left behind is a white dwarf, and in chapter 23, we talked about medium mass stars, how above a certain mass, stars won't be able to make a white dwarf. They will instead explode and leave behind a neutron star. Or in chapter 24, we talked about the very highest mass stars can leave behind a black hole. It is all one single story. And this slide helps us in one single diagram kind of have a sense of how that story is connected. For low mass stars, which means stars less than about eight or 10 solar masses, they live the longest out of these three options. They will form a red giant when they leave the main sequence, their outer layers will create a planetary nebula, and they will leave behind a white dwarf a white dwarf whose mass is below the Chandrasekhar limit of 1.4 solar masses. For medium mass stars, that means stars between 10 and roughly 40 solar masses, although that upper limit is a little bit um, difficult for um, astronomers to pinpoint. They are larger when they're on the main sequence. They live for slightly less time than the low mass stars. They will explode as a type two supernova and they will leave behind a neutron star, possibly with beams of radiation to make it a pulsar. That neutron star will have a mass between 1.4 solar masses and three solar masses. And then the very highest mass stars, more than 40 solar masses, they are the rarest, but when we have them, they will become a massive supergiant when they leave the main sequence. They will also explode as a type two supernova, but the object they leave behind will be a black hole. And that black hole will have a mass of at least three solar masses. The website linked here at the bottom shows us this process happening on an HR diagram with a lot of information to go along with it. I highly encourage you to play around with that um, website and all of the different things that it's able to show you. Now, a couple of questions to help make sure that things are solidifying in our heads properly. Out of the options listed, what is the best fit for the eventual fate of our own sun? So pause the video and think through it. Okay. The sun is not in a binary system and it is a low mass star. The only option available to us that fits that pair of requirements is option three here. The sun will become a steadily cooling white dwarf. Eventually it will cool down so much that it doesn't even glow. It will be called a black dwarf at that point, although that's not really a focus of our curriculum. Um, but it won't be able to explode as a type one supernova because it has no binary companion to give it extra mass. Now, our sun is also not going to become a nova, and why is that? So read through the options. Why can the sun not create a nova? All right, reading through all of these, 
when we discussed Nova, Nove in um, the first chapter 23 video, we talked about how that is when a white dwarf in a binary system is getting a little bit of extra material that it can just go through a surface level of fusion for. That only happens to stars that have a binary companion. All right, one that takes you a little bit more reading, so pause the video to have as much time as you need. Which of the following lists in the correct order a possible evolutionary path for a star? So read through all of your options and then pick the one that makes the most sense. All right, let's go through these top to bottom and talk about if they work or what the problem is. So the first option here, red giant, neutron star, white dwarf, nothing. It has a lot of different issues with it. You cannot make two different stellar remnants. A neutron star and a white dwarf are two very different endpoints of stellar, stellar evolution. We can't ever have both of them happen. In option two here, a red giant, then a type 2 supernova, then a black hole. So far, that seems reasonable for a high-mass star above 40 solar masses. But there isn't a way to get rid of that black hole, and so the fact that it ends with nothing implies that we have been able to get rid of that object, that nothing is left behind, zero mass, and that is not the case. So option two you might have picked if you weren't quite sure what we meant by the word nothing, but it's not correct. Option three, red giant, type two supernova, planetary nebula, neutron star. A type two supernova and a planetary nebula are the two different possibilities for the outer layers of a star. We cannot make both of them because that's using the same material to do two different things. So option three has a problem because it has two phases that deal with the outer layers. Option four, a red giant, then a planetary nebula, and then a white dwarf. That works perfectly fine. That's what the sun is going to do. And option five, red giant, planetary nebula, black hole. We cannot make a black hole except from an extremely violent event uh, like a type two supernova and not the gentle puffing off of layers in a planetary nebula. So five is not correct either. The answer here is four. What I really need to make sure we understand is that the real world is far more complicated than the three stellar evolution paths that we highlighted in this summary video. There are many more details and complications beyond what we cover. Some of those details are in our textbook. Others are even more complex than what our introductory textbook um, includes. But no matter what, the mass of a star is what determines which of these paths it's able to take, whether it's the ones that we listed a couple of slides back or the one in this particular image. The mass of a star tells us everything about what can and cannot happen to it. So we will have further activities on stellar evolution as a whole, the birth of stars, the lifetimes of stars, the death of stars, and there are a lot of great activities in some of the supplementary workbooks that we've been including in these um, end slides. As always, re-watching videos is one of the big advantages to having pre-recorded lectures. Pausing so that you can take notes is another too. Please make sure you're taking advantage of these different ways to make ideas make more sense to you, and always the discussion boards and other aspects of the course are something that you can participate in as well to clear up any confusion or answer any questions. I will see you in the next module.